Okay, sorry. And welcome back. We are here on day four of problem solving with Smithsonian experts. My name is Jonathan, and I've had the lucky opportunity to be working together with all of you and meeting all of these fantastic Smithsonian uh, researchers and curators uh, and experts. And I hope you've been enjoying the journey as we learn about the work they do and about the questions that, that they ask. Those of you who were in our last session asked some pretty amazing questions, and we hope you will continue thinking in that same way as we consider biodiversity in a different way. I am going to go ahead, though, and bring up for all of you an early version of the illustration that our colleague Dan Porter captured from our prior session. So he is in the process of completing this illustration, and it and all of his renderings of our time together in each of these sessions will, will be posted over the conference site in the next couple of days. So check out the ones that are there already and the new ones that we'll be adding. Dan, thank you for capturing this. This is pretty exciting. I love the way you wrote Animal Bones. Nicely done. Um, we will go ahead, though, and switch gears now. And we're going to be talking about how we can learn about nature's most elusive animals. And we'll be heading to the rainforest for this with Joe Kalowski. I'll be introducing him in a moment. But don't forget, you can use the area on the left side of the screen to send in your questions and comments as we go along. Recordings of all of the sessions, including ones you may have missed or wish to revisit, are posted on the program page. And the exhibit hall is a great way to continue your exploration of each topic. And if we don't get to your question today, the discussion area below each program listing will allow you to continue the dialogue with our experts and with each other. So check that out. We are going to go ahead now and turn the floor over to Joe Kalowski and learn a little bit about he tracks animals that most of us never see. Joe, thanks okay. for being here. Thanks a lot. Welcome, everybody. Um, I thought I would start out the session today with just giving you a little bit of an idea about what we do in our research center at the National Zoo here at the Smithsonian. So there's six different research centers at the zoo. And ours is called the Center for Conservation, Education, and Sustainability. And um, our general mission here is to study and understand the complex relationship among animals, people, and the environment, and to educate the next generation of conservation practitioners. So that's a, an obviously a very broad and ambitious uh, mission, but I'll go into it in a little more detail here. So we have education conservation training programs, which I won't be able to get into today. We're going to focus on our field programs. And what we do here in our center is we've taken kind of a novel approach to achieving conservation through sustainable development. And what we do is we collaborate, we, we form partnerships with select energy companies that are working in pristine environments. And our objectives in these partnerships are twofold. First, we want to provide business and industry with science-based solutions for minimizing their impact on biodiversity. And in, in these collaborations, we want to promote or integrate biodiversity conservation into energy development and all the operations that are going on. And you'll see how we do this as we go through the session today. But some of our projects that are ongoing around the world are collaborations with Shell, Repsol, and uh, a third company called Peru LNG. So as a center, most of the field work that we do is focused on tropical ecosystems. And the main reason why that is is that many of the world's biodiversity hotspots are located in tropical rainforests. And when I say hotspots, we're talking about areas that have very high levels of species diversity whose long-term stability are, are somehow threatened. And so we can pose a question to the audience here as I continue through what some of these threats might be to tropical biodiversity. You can see Joe's question over there on the left side of the screen. and. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this. Um, we're hearing deforestation is coming up immediately from some of our mm -hmm. participants. Uh, uh, someone more broadly saying humans uh, and global warming. Yeah, deforestation is a huge thing. Tropical rainforests are actually disappearing at a faster rate than any other biome on Earth. Uh, some of the deforestation is related to oil palm plantation conversion. In other cases, it's related to simply subsistence agriculture, small-scale agriculture. Um, some, some of the other things that, that really come up in these environments are um, hunting. This could be both commercial hunting and subsistence hunting. Um, and, and many people are bringing up humans. Obviously, uh, 
all these threats are related in one way or another to humans. Uncontrolled, unregulated mining is a, is a big issue. And, and finally, oil and gas development, which is one thing we're going to talk a little bit more about today and, and something that I, that I work with in my research. So as a center, we've chosen to focus uh, on these areas because of a, lo a lot of these threats exist. And, and given that all these threats do exist in these habitats where incredibly high levels of biodiversity exist, there really is a critical need for research to see how biodiversity responds to these threats. And so as a center, um, in forming these strategic partnerships with, with selected energy companies, our perspective is that given the increasing demand for these types of resources, oil and gas resources, exploration and development is continuing with or without with or without us involved. And our goal here is to identify companies that have a real interest in conservation and sustainability and use scientific studies to better inform these efforts. So in terms of energy development, large portions of the tropical rainforest, in particular in the Amazon, are currently leased to energy companies. Now today we're going to be talking about Peru and and this is certainly true in Peru. So we're going to open up a multiple choice question here to the audience. And we're curious to know if you were to guess what or if you know what percentage of the Peruvian Amazon is leased to oil and gas companies. And the responses are coming in. And uh, it's uh, fairly close between 23 and 72 percent right now. Uh, would either of these be correct? 72 percent is unfortunately, oh for better or worse, the the amount of the Peruvian Amazon that's currently leased to these companies. This is a graphic here from a publication by Finer et al. that shows in yellow the concessions throughout Peru and you can see Peru's boundary in black here um, and in the yellow areas the hatched areas are under negotiation and the solid yellow areas are currently leased and, and under some sort of activity. So the area that we're going to be talking about today is uh, a study area that we established uh, close to the Ecuador border. It's a huge, huge oil concession of uh, almost 9,000 square kilometers and it's incredibly remote, more than 250 kilometers from the nearest uh, major town. And you can see here in red the location of this oil concession within Peru. So this shows you from the air what this area looks like. Uh, it's primary rainforest. It's completely roadless. As I said, there's no, almost no communities uh, living in this entire area. So it's an enormous area and, and basically no human activities going on here. So it's really an incredible area to work in. Now, the company that we've collaborated with here is called Repsol, and they began exploration for oil in this area in March of 2008. So even with the company present, there's very little going on in the area other than exploration. And so we want to give you a, a little bit quickly an idea of what exploration consists of. Uh, seismic exploration is the method that we're going to be talking about. And in areas that are this remote, the, what the companies do is they avoid building any roads within the area uh, for many different reasons, one of them being uh, conservation. And so all the travel, all the movement of equipment and people is done by helicopter. And so you can see here uh, in the center of the screen one of the helipads that's opened in the rainforest to allow establishment of campsites and movement of equipment. And this is one of these helipads constructed in the rainforest uh, that you can see here. So there's basically three waves of activity that move through pretty quickly. The first team comes in, establishes some campsites, and they're going to be cutting trails in the forest along what we call seismic lines. So you can see here on the left one of these trails. It's not very large. And, and large trees are left in the trail like you can see here. And uh, you can see another trail on the right. So you can see that they're not cutting large trees. And it's a relatively small trail. And so the teams lay out these lines. A second team comes through and drills wells every 50 meters and plants explosives underground. And then a third team comes through and detonates the explosives. And the seismic waves, the sound waves that are, that are reflected from the, the Earth's surface underneath, tell the engineers about the likelihood that, and the size of potential oil deposits in the ground. So this is the activity that's happening. It takes about two and a half or three months for all these teams to move through one particular area of the rainforest. 
And so given that this was going on and our partnership with this company, uh, we laid out a couple of basic objectives for the research that I'm going to be walking us through today. First of all, very few scientists have been able to access this forest because of how remote it is. And so even very basic wildlife surveys haven't been carried out here. So first we wanted to know simply what wildlife species occurred in this area. And it, it seems like a basic question, but we'll see that it can be relatively difficult. The other thing that we wanted to do is look at the impact of these exploration operations on forest wildlife. Although these exploration um, projects are going on in forests and, and other habitats around the world every day, almost no studies have looked at the response of wildlife to these activities. So that was one of our big objectives. These questions seem relatively straightforward, but when you stop and think about the logistics, study design, actually going out and collecting the data and being able to make conclusions, uh, you'll see how complicated it can actually get. So this is actually the habitat that I'm most used to working in, at least before I started working in the Amazon. And this is a picture of the Maasai Mara Game Reserve in southwest Kenya. And when you want to study wildlife, and particularly mammalian wildlife like, like I focus on, it's actually very easy in a habitat like this. All you do is watch the animals. And so here's some shots of some of the animals that you see on a daily basis in the Mara. And it's very easy to collect information about these animals because they're so visible. So you can see the difference in the landscape here. This is a, a shot from the air of our study area in Peru. And then we'll drop down to the forest itself. And so you can see here that the vegetation is obviously very different. The forest closes in on you. The vegetation is incredibly dense. And wildlife can be incredibly difficult to see. So one of the main issues we face as biologists is how do we study the animals that we can't see? How do we collect information about what's in this forest, how it's behaving, and even more complicated, how do we know how they're reacting to certain disturbances that are going on? So that's the overall theme of the session today and what we're going to work through together. And as we go along, I'm going to be introducing you to some of the other challenges that we face as biologists working in, in areas like this. So given that we have our objectives, we know what we want to do, uh, what options do we have in terms of methodologies and how to actually collect the data? In terms of mammals, which is what we're going to be talking about today, traditional techniques in studying mammals in a rainforest and many other habitats involve direct observation of animals and signs of their presence. So in the photo here besides the Leatherman on the left, uh, do people see anything else? Go ahead, tell us what you see in this photo other than the tool in the lower left corner. What, what, do, you, what do you see in here? Go ahead and tell us. Uh, we're seeing some responses coming in. We see some very observant people immediately seeing what it took me actually a little while to notice. Uh, there you go. Yes, yeah, so in this photo, most people, or at least a lot of people, have, have seen what's present here. Uh, there's actually footprint of a jaguar. Um, let me just try and highlight it for you. All right. OK, so my drawing abilities are going <laughs> to make their way into the presentation. And uh, so that's at least the area where the jaguar print is present. And so using signs like this, um, fecal deposits, tracks, dens, and actual direct observations of animals are what people traditionally use to collect information about mammalian wildlife in a setting like a rainforest. So using these traditional survey methods, uh, again, they're based on direct observation of either the animals themselves or the signs that they leave behind. And there's a, quite a few complications that arise when you, when you base a study on these kinds of methods. One is that very low density animals, animals that are rare in the environment, are often never seen. And, and the signs of them are often never left. Often, uh, or in, in addition, animals that are wary of humans are often not observed because they're going to be very aware of your presence. And these methods are really biased towards larger species that leave larger sign. They're more obvious in the rainforest and species that are active during the day. And we'll talk about activity patterns a little bit later. 
So what's the solution? How do we address some of these problems and the biases that are related to traditional methodologies? So if you read about the description of the talk today, of the session today, you'd know that that what let me see, do I need to erase that? That what we use in our study and, and something that really gets really addresses a lot of these biases and these problems is camera trapping. So that's what we're going to start talking about now. This is a photo of a jaguar from our Peruvian study area. And we'll see a lot more fun photos as we go along. So what's camera trapping? So in our, can in our context here, camera trapping is the use of motion and heat activated trail cameras uh, in order to gain biological information about wildlife species. So these, these cameras are placed in a study area, often on trees or posts, and photos are recorded of passing animals and used to address a wide variety of biological questions. So the use of this technique has actually increased dramatically in the last um, 10 or 15 years. The first study that was published using camera traps to study wildlife was in 1995 and it was based on a study um, focusing on tigers in India and ever since then due largely to increasing technology increase, increased um, capabilities in the technology the popularity of this method has really flourished and this is a graph showing the number of scientific papers that have used camera trapping to study wildlife. Now, as I said, the technology has increased a huge amount over the last 15 years, and one of the things driving that has been use of this technology by recreational hunters. These types of equipment are very popular with hunters because it allows them to track the movements and the presence of different species that they're interested in hunting. And so these, these cameras have been marketed very heavily towards recreational hunters, and only recently have they been marketed towards wildlife biologists. So we've got over the last particular five years huge diversity of different products and um, here's a shot of some of the types of cameras that have been used very commonly in the last 10 years and these are film based cameras and you can imagine some of the frustration that might be involved in using film cameras uh, in a very remote study area where you might not even see the photos for a number of months. Um, and so fortunately, recently, digital cameras have become a lot more effective. The technology has come a long way and they've become affordable. And so here's some of the models of digital cameras that are being used out there today. So what are some of the advantages that we get when we start using camera traps? These things are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether you are there or not. Uh, the size bias is really reduced, so they're taking pictures of small animals as well as large animals, although that bias is still there. There's no influence of human presence. You set these things in the forest or whatever habitat, and, and the fact that you are there setting up the camera doesn't influence. Once you leave the area, the camera's working and there's no humans around. And you have really high confidence in confirming the presence of that animal. You've got a photograph that proves that animal was there. There's really no further discussion needed. They're also relatively easy to use. You can train field staff to use them quickly as opposed to training them how to recognize tracks and prints. And they're becoming more and more affordable. And so obviously I'm a big fan of this technique, but can anybody think of a disadvantage of using equipment like this in the rainforest, for example? We already have some responses to that question. Uh, Christy wondering if maybe camera trapping makes the animals realize what we're doing. Does it actually influence in any way the behaviors you're trying to study? Um, we have people talking about damage or the water and being able to properly waterproof the rain, equipment. Rain, yes. A lot of people are saying rain, and that's a huge, huge issue. So in terms of influencing the animals, you'll see that a lot of the photos show animals looking at the camera, and they do often see them, but uh, we haven't seen it seem to influence their behavior in any negative way. But the rain is a huge issue. In, in the Peruvian rainforest, um, rain is common and intense, and you really need to make sure that the cameras are well built and very, very waterproof. And jo so that can be in a disadvantage. Uh, Joe, Annalisa was wanting to clarify, are these cameras motion uh, censored? 
Right. These cameras are motion sensitive and they're also heat sensitive. So you can imagine that there would be a huge disadvantage in having it just be motion sensitive where the wind blowing vegetation and things like that would make the camera take pictures all day. So it has to be moving heat in order for the camera to take the picture. I, th I think well, th this question from Indonesia says that in Indonesia um, th camera theft is a, uh, a, a problem. Is there any issue here in this remote area of anyone in stealing the camera? Yeah, that's a good question. In many, many areas this is a huge problem. And, a and actually in Belize I know of a study where they're actually constructing pods made of concrete blocks in which they set the cameras uh, in order to reduce the chances of theft. Fortunately here there's absolutely nobody in the forest and we didn't even have to lock the cameras at all so so that was a big advantage. And this is a photo of the type of camera that we used. It's called a Reconyx. You'll see that name in the corner of the photos. A Reconyx RC55 digital camera. So we focused in our study on ocelots for a number of reasons and you'll be seeing a lot of pictures of these cats as we go along. One of the reasons we focused on them is is in terms of large animals and predators these are very very common and so it gives us a good sample size to actually conduct our study. Uh, some recent work has also shown them to be sensitive to some disturbances like selective logging and subsistence hunting and so they may be a good indicator of the impacts of some disturbances in the rainforest. And being relatively high on the food chain, uh, their trophic level being relatively high, that means that they might respond to impacts of the disturbance, but also impacts on their prey species as well. And so they may be a good species to focus on. And that's, that's why one of the reasons why we selected them for our study. Another reason is that they are relatively unstudied in this part of the Amazon. This is a graphic from a paper by Di Batetti et al. that shows in green all the different studies that have documented population sizes of ocelots and you can see they have a huge range from from southern US all the way to southern South America and our study area is located here in red and so you can see there's a huge part of the ocelots range where nobody has really looked at populations of ocelots and so that was another reason that we wanted to focus on them. Okay, so we know what we want to do. We know we're going to use camera trapping and we know where we want to do it and what our objectives are. So the next step is really getting out there. And uh, we're going to walk through how challenging that actually is. This is um, our starting point here in Washington, D.C. And we're going to make our way all the way down to uh, northwestern, northern Kenya. So let's step through it here. I'm just going to zoom in on South America and you can see the outline of the Amazon rainforest here in dark green. And we're going to zoom into Peru now. So in our trip we'd be flying into Lima on the coast of Peru here and ultimately making our way into northern Peru into the Amazon to Iquitos here. And so let's zoom in to Iquitos which is here in the lower right. And Iquitos is located on the Amazon River and so the next two days of our journey is by boat. And so we're going to travel up the Amazon River and then along the Napo, which is this river here, and then along the Kurai River, which ultimately goes into Ecuador. And we're going to stop, we're going to get off the boat two days later around here. So here's a picture of our departure early in the morning in, in Iquitos uh, on the Amazon. And these are some of the other biologists that were part of our Smithsonian team in the rainforest. There was other research going on in addition to this, this mammal study. Here's a view of our boat stopped in the town of Masan and a view of the river as we were steaming along for, for two days. And ultimately this is where we ended up. This is the base camp of the, the company that we were working with and um, this is where all the engineers and all the different employees that they have uh, as part of this huge operation are based. And you can see there's a number of, of facilities here. There's a large number of air-conditioned offices here. These are huge tents uh, for the engineers and the, the upper-level management, kitchen and dining. So this is a pretty, pretty well-outfitted facility here. And um, we didn't spend a lot of time in this <laughs> location. Our, our research couldn't be based here and we had to make our way quite a bit deeper into the rainforest and so uh, this is the path that we would be taking to the helipad. 
I also gave before departing a, a lecture or a, a talk to the oil company employees, telling them what we were planning to do, talking to them about mammalian wildlife, and uh, trying to get them excited about the, the research in detail that they were supporting. So this is the next step. It's about a 30-minute helicopter ride into the rainforest where we worked. Um, not as well outfitted a camp as you saw in that picture, but quite a comfortable camp actually in the end. So these are all the, um, the pieces of equipment that we needed to outfit our camp with, and these are taken by helicopter to the, into the forest. And I think we're just going to show a short video here of, um, of us actually landing at our campsite for the first time. And so you guys can, can maybe... Okay, so you guys, pretty noisy helicopter. You guys can maybe guess how long it took from leaving my office in D.C. to when I actually touched down in that campsite there. So what do you think? How long uh, did that journey take? By the way, while people guess at that, we did have a question about the average length of one of your expeditions, not in terms of getting there, but how long it takes to, uh, to do an expedition. The whole study in general. Study. Yeah, this, this study, it varies quite a bit depending on what we're trying to do, but this study involved about five months of living in the rainforest here and, and collecting data. Great. And that's probably about average, maybe a, b a bit longer than average. So we're seeing uh, anything from an hour to 48 hours coming in here. Uh, would that range be close? Yeah, four days would actually be a good estimate of door-to-door of -door, um, from D.C. to our campsite. And, and that's really not including, you know, things like, like waiting for other planes and boats to come in and that kind of stuff. So if it was a smooth journey, which it often isn't, um, about four days would be about what it would take. So, so this is a map here showing the oil concession, the black in the black boundary, and our study site here in red. And the orange lines that are shown are actually the seismic lines that were ultimately put into the rainforest. When we first arrived at the forest, those lines aren't there, those weren't present, because we wanted to get there before any of this exploration actually started. Okay, so in a, a relatively small amount of time, we had a pretty comfortable camp set up. So I have some pictures here just to show you what the setup is like. Uh, the shower is there on, on the left in black, and our kitchen and dining tent is on the right. And uh, provisions, food, and supplies were brought, dropped off by helicopter in a cargo net every eight days or so if things went to plan, which they usually did. Okay, so this is another shot of our campsite. Um, you can see how small it is from the air there up on the upper left. Uh, this is my tent on the right, and you can see kind of our main research tent um, on that picture in the lower left as well. This is me chatting with some of my colleagues there. Okay, so we've got our campsite. Let's get down to the work. So what you're seeing in this photo is something that I created in my office in DC using some maps of the area. The, the blue lines are the seismic exploration lines that ultimately were put in. And these orange dots are the camera stations that we mapped out. The yellow dot on the right is the campsite that we proposed. And again, this is me sitting in my office trying to map out camera sites that would would be spaced effectively for studying ocelots. There's recommendations on, on how best to do that. And so this area is about 25 square kilometers. And what we do is basically set up these, these designs in the office. And when we get out to the field, we'd use handheld GPS units to actually get to some of these locations. So some of you may be familiar with using GPS equipment and, and maybe you can just chat about in, in the chat there what some people are familiar with using GPS tools for. Uh, Mark does want to know if the GPS that uh, you used worked well under the forest canopy. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Uh, up until a few years ago it was very difficult to use GPS equipment in the rainforest and fortunately the te technology is getting better and better and we actually didn't have any problem in this rainforest using 
relatively affordable GPS units. So geocaching, yeah, that's that's a fun thing to do with GPS equipment. Um, a lot of people are probably familiar with the GPS on the cars and cell phones, which a lot of people are are chatting about there, and and those are obviously very useful things to have. And for a biologist in the field, these units are are really almost essential, and so they really do serve a lot of different uses. In terms of our study area, I just wanted to give you a sense of how big it is. We're sort of limited there because there's no roads, there's no boatways within our study area on the amount of a amount of area that we can cover by walking. And so that sort of determined how big of an area we could cover with our study, but um, maybe you guys could guess in terms of getting a perspective on the size here, 25 square kilometers was about the area covered by our camera stations. About how many soccer fields would fit into an area like that? See if we can get some perspective. And the choices are coming in. Um, most people think it's either 40 or 100. Actually, it's about even right now. About even. Okay, so a hundred, almost 140 soccer fields would actually fit in our study area here. So this is an area that we needed to cover on a daily basis on foot. And so the next real step is to create a system of trails. And the amount of trails that we anticipated we needed to to open would be about 23 miles, 37 kilometers worth of trails. And so that's really the next step of what we need to do. This is one of our trails in the rainforest. You can see that it's very difficult even to see in this picture. And this took about three weeks, actually, to actually open up all the trails that we needed. These are some of my assistants working uh, with machete only to cut these trails in the rainforest. And we often hit some obstacles in making these trails. A, a biologist sitting in an office in DC has a um, only a limited view of what they're going to encounter when they get to the rainforest. So this is actually one of the bigger creek crossings that we had to navigate in making some of these trails and, and uh, you can see that we figure out ways around them but it often influences what we can do when we get out into the field. So if we look at what sort of I, I planned in my office here we can overlay the actual camera sites which are in red now and the actual trails that we ended up opening you can see some of the trails are pretty straight and some of them we had to make some diversions you can also note that the lower left hand uh, grid the lower left hand camera station was never established we actually couldn't make it out to that location so we ended up with 23 camera stations in the end And creek crossings really aren't the only thing you have to worry about. I actually found working in the Amazon to be a lot more comfortable than I expected it to be, but there are some dangers that people need to be aware of. Um, if we were to ask how many of these creatures I encountered in my camp in the first week, the answer would be all of them. Um, <laughs> but I can open up a question to you guys. Uh, what do you think I should have been most worried about finding in my camp? So there they are, choices A through F. Look at those pictures. They're all labeled accordingly. Which do you think he should have been most worried about? <laughs> Keeping in mind, he did encounter all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, B is getting the most votes right now, Joe. There's something about the, the critter in B that's mm, scaring me. I agree. It doesn't look too uh, inviting. Actually, the answer to this question is A. Um... The snake that's shown in picture A is actually called a pygmy coral snake and you can see that it's one of the few coral snakes actually that doesn't have the banding patterns on its backside, on its dorsal surface and so it's actually very difficult to tell that this is a dangerous snake. Um, but it's called a pygmy coral snake and is by far the most dangerous of the animals that, that were shown here. Fortunately we didn't uh, have any trouble with it. Uh, Joe, what's, number, what's item D? Item D is actually a species of cricket, and you can't actually see the size. That cricket's probably about four or five inches long. Um, and I don't know the actual, the specific name of that cricket, but it was actually often in our campsite, and it's totally harmless. We should mention that uh, our final session today will actually explore beetles. So if you're interested in, in organisms of roughly this size, um, you will enjoy <laughs> our last session today. Okay, so the final step really is to set up our cameras. And I'm going to sort of open it up. You guys can chat as I talk here about some of the factors that, that go into setting up these cameras effectively. The last thing you want is to get out here after all this effort 
and not set up your cameras well and, and, and get a good amount of photos that are usable for the research. And so you guys can chat about some of the factors here and I'll show you one of our stations. This is a shot from one camera and it's looking at the opposing camera. We have two cameras at each station. And there's a number of factors that really go into this and one of the important things is to find a place where you know the animals are going to be walking. And, and in this situation we have a creek sort of a creek crossing here. There's a trail that comes down a hill and goes back up the hill and this is the only place that it's really easy to cross this creek. And so we know that animals are going to be moving there. There's a lot of other factors like height. I'm seeing some people um, mention height is very important in terms of making sure that you get the small as well as the large animals. And other things like sunlight. You don't want the camera to be facing into the sun. It can make pictures very difficult to see. And so there's a lot of different factors like that. So now that we have our camera set up, these things are going to be running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Once we have these cameras running and we ran them for five months, we can start to get an idea of the species that are found in the forest. And so as I go through a couple of our more interesting photos that we documented, you guys can chat about what species you might have expected to find in the Amazon rainforest. And I think a couple of these will be surprising to many of you. So this species here is called a margay. And this species is interesting because it looks very, very similar to an ocelot, which is the species that we were focusing our study on. And initially, I had a, quite a bit of difficulty telling these two species apart in the photos. And um, there are a number of things that you can look at here to distinguish the species. And I'll just show you a couple of them. One is that the tail in a margay is much, much longer and a bit thicker than in the ocelot, which is shown on the right here. This is a shorter, thinner tail. The head on a margay is smaller, and the eyes are quite a bit bigger, at least in the eye shine on these photographs. The animal is, in general, smaller than an ocelot, the margay is, um, but that's often hard to tell on a photo because there's no size context there. But eventually I was able to tell these two species apart. So we're just going to run through quickly some of the species. Um, this is a short-eared dog. A lot of people don't realize that there's two dog species found in the Amazon. And this is one of them. Uh, the other dog species is called a bush dog. And these animals are social. They often travel at least in pairs. And this is one of only two photos that we got of this species. This is a very, very rare animal. Even indigenous people living in rainforests often will not ever see an animal, one of these bush dogs, in their life. And so we were really fortunate to get two photos of this species. And uh, this is out of five months of camera trapping. And so a very, very rare animal. But at least when they stopped, they looked at your camera. They did, fortunately, stopped long enough to get a good picture, which I always <laughs> was appreciative of. <laughs> Uh, this is a jaguarundi. This is one of a number of different cats, pr cat predators that are found in the Amazon. Here we have a giant armadillo, which is a very prehistoric, very fascinating creature. I never got to see one directly, but we did get a number of photos of them. And I'm going to stop here and, and sort of ask people what they think about how we actually got these photos from the cameras. And that's a question many people have had for you, so I'm, okay. I'm curious to hear what, what people are, uh, what people's thoughts are on that. So how did they retrieve these pictures? We actually had uh, Janine asking, are they uploaded to you in real time, or do you do some sort of batch once a day, or do you go out there periodically? Right, real-time uploading would be fantastic if we could sit in our camp and just have the photos come feeding in. Uh, unfortunately, that technology is a little bit far away, but what we do is we basically have a handheld um, hard drive, basically, that we bring in the field and we take memory cards out of the cameras, put them into this reader, and we can actually view the photos immediately as we download them. And that's that was really by far the most exciting time during the field work is basically like opening up presents. Um, and we really get really excited to see what kind of animals we get there. And, and that was really my favorite part of the field work. So a couple other species here. This is a a puma. This animal is found uh, all the way from from the northern U.S. And, and lower Canada all the way down to Argentina. Uh, it's the same species and so we have it in the rainforest as well. 
We've got a group of white-lipped peccaries here, a pig species. And this is an animal called a tyra. People in the U.S. might be familiar with an animal called a fisher, and this is actually a similar species here. And I put this next photo in to, um, to show you that we don't always just get mammals. Um, sorry. We actually get some bird photos as we go through. And, uh, okay, that photo's not showing up, but that's all right. So in the end, we actually photographed 28 different species of mammals. And this was, remember, one of our objectives to really document what species were found there. And, again, this I just remind people that this isn't a complete list. There are species like bats, species of mammals like bats, shrews, um, animals that don't spend a lot of time on the ground walking around that aren't simply going to be photographed, primates as well. But we did get a very good list of species, and the, and the cameras actually are relatively good at, at photographing small creatures. There's a, a, an animal pictured in this photo. I'm not sure if anybody can see it, uh, but I'm going to zoom in on it here, and this is actually a mouse possum. This is the smallest species that we photographed, and so the cameras are amazingly good at photographing even small species. And so after five months, we did get a, a relatively complete list of larger mammals in this study area, some of which had not been confirmed for the area yet, like the bush dog and the shore deer dog. And some of them, like the giant armadillo and the um, tapir, which are actually threatened or endangered within Peru. So we were very happy with the results in the end. But you do end up with a whole lot of photos. So I wonder if people could guess how many photos we ended up with, uh, with 23 camera stations over a five-month period. And we put a poll up on the screen. We're curious what your best mathematical estimate would be, everybody. Um, most people think it's somewhere between maybe 4,400, 6,600. Yeah, 4,400 photos is more or less what we ended up with. And so it's a huge amount of photos to organize and to keep track of and to sift through. And so the big question is, how do we go from all these photos to research results. And that's what we're going to work through a little bit now. Now, one of the things that we get in in running cameras for this amount of time is a number of photographs that are really interesting. This is one that shows an ocelot with a mouse possum in its mouth that it had just hunted. And here's another photo showing a collared peccary with some young. And so you can start to get an idea of what these animals are feeding on, maybe when they're having their young, how many young they're having, but these photos are relatively rare. Uh, the other thing that we get often is really cool uh, sequences of photos that are taken one second after another that actually result in video. And so I'm going to show a video of an ocelot walking in front of a camera frame here. And so this is obviously really exciting to actually see the animals moving through the rainforest. I'm going to play that again, Joe, okay. just in case anyone missed it, because these are elusive animals. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so the technology is incredible. But unfortunately, these things are relatively rare, these sorts of photos. And what you need to do is focus on the type of information that we can get in large quantity and make some conclusions and answer some of our research questions. And so. Looking at this photo, what kind of data can we collect? If we just look at one single image, what can we learn about what's going on in the photo about this species just from a single photo? We know that we know that this species exists in this area now, right? So we have a confirmation of the species, and that's going to be used for things like a species list. And actually, while you're thinking about what we can get from the photo, I'll say that in the virtual exhibit space, we created uh, an exercise that people can use either with their classes or just on their own. Uh, we put a whole lot of photos of different animals and we put a field guide in there where we identify the species. And so you can use that field guide and try and match up the rest of the photos and identify some of those different animals that we photographed and even use some resources online to help you use the to help you do those identifications. So you get all of that fun part without the four days of travel. Exactly. Good. Um, we're seeing things like age habits based on the timestamps of the photos, whether it's a ground feeder, comes out during the day. Good answers, folks. Yeah, those are all great things. And, and the, 
the time of day that it's active is is a really important one, and that's what we're going to go into now. Based on these data, you can make conclusions about the ecology of these animals. When are they active? What time of day are they active? What habitats are they using if you put your cameras in different habitats? So I'm going to focus on the activity. Um, this is a shot of what the data looks like in a database. And uh, GRAC is an abbreviation for one of the species that we have. Camera station, camera number, time and date, and all that kind of information. And what we can do is boil that down if we're interested in, in activity patterns, what time of day they're active. And on the right here is showing uh, each hour of the day and the number of captures that we had of a particular species in each hour of the day. And then we can convert that to a percent the percent of all the photos that were taken in that hour of the day. And so for each species, we can look and see when they're active. This is a short-eared dog activity pattern. And you can see that noon is here in the middle. And so this animal is diurnal. This means that this animal is only active during the day. And this is a Brazilian tapir. And you can see that this has almost the opposite pattern. This is noon here in the middle. And so we call this animal nocturnal. This animal is active at night. So one of the things we did with the ocelots was to look at the activity of the ocelots before the seismic exploration occurred. And we continued the camera survey during all this disturbance, during the seismic exploration activity. And that's shown in the, the solid line here. And so this is showing the activity pattern of ocelots in our study area in both periods. And we can do certain statistical analyses here, and it shows that, and you can sort of see looking at it, there really is no significant difference in when the animals were active. And if we put nighttime in gray here, we can see that the animals uh, were very nocturnal. And the actual the percent of time they were spent, they were active during the day, was the same. And so what we were interested in, because all this disturbance was going on in the daytime, we were wondering if ocelots became less active during the day. And in fact, they didn't. And so this starts to give us some indication of the response of this species to this disturbance. OK, so there's another reason um, that we focused on the ocelots. And that's because you can get a huge amount of data from species that you can recognize individually. And this question has come up. People are wondering if you, if you had knowingly taken uh, pictures of the same animals multiple times. So, it's, okay. uh, so I think they're curious to hear your answer. Right, exactly. So the beauty of the ocelot and some other species like jaguar and margay is that all the spot patterns on each individual are unique. They're like fingerprints. And so we can identify each cat that we photograph. That's why we had cameras on both sides of the trail so that we got pictures of both sides of the animal's coat. And so we can go through the photos and identify each individual. And so this is how we do it. This is a photo of one of our males. And you can zero in on a particular part of the coat of the animal which I'm going to do here, and we can zoom in on that. And basically, you can use this as a fingerprint that you'll look for in all the other photos. And so we're going to post a, a chat here as we go along if people could suggest other animals that they know of in the areas that they live that you might also be able to identify individually. Right, so specific instances of a certain species. How do you identify that you're seeing the same animal on multiple occasions. What animals do you have where you live that you can identify specifically? And what is it about them that you can use to identify them? So we'd love to hear. We're uh, already hearing uh, tigers and zebras in Indonesia Great. and uh, dogs, uh, skunks. Skunks is an interesting uh, possibility, actually. I'm not aware of how much variation the skunks have in their coat patterns, but that is definitely a possibility. So let's walk through it then. We've got an interesting pattern here on this ocelot's coat that I've put in orange. And so let's use that to try and identify this species again. Here's another photo of the same cat. And we can zero in on that same pattern and zoom it in. And so this is the kind of thing that we do. We basically focus on one area, something that's distinctive. And then we use that to look for that same individual in the rest of the ocelot photos and start to figure out how many individuals we have. So here's four different ocelots that we photographed. And let's see how many people can identify the male that was in the previous two photographs. Oh, wow. Let's find out. We'll go ahead and uh, put that poll up on the top left. By the way, is, the, uh, is there special software technology you use to do this kind of identification, or is it all done by eye looking at the photos? It's interesting. I, I do it by just looking at the photos, but there are 
people that are developing software for tiger identification because there's so few tigers left in the world that they're actually using it to, to, to have software that digitally recognizes the image and the pattern and that can be used to identify tigers that are poached when the skins are found in other locations so they can actually match the tigers back to where they were killed. And so people are developing really neat software to do that. So most people are getting it. The A is the correct answer here. That's our same mail from the previous photos. Good job. So we've actually made an exercise that people can use with their classes if they're teachers or just do amongst themselves, also in the exhibit hall, um, where we've put a whole bunch of ocelot photos and we've given you a key of six ocelots with their names and an answer key that will tell you who's pictured in all the other photos. And so you can go through the exercise and see if you can identify who's who. Okay. So once we can identify these individuals, we can get a huge amount of data that we can't get from animals that we can't recognize. And these are some of the examples. We can figure out how far the animals are moving based on where they're photographed. We can figure out uh, how big their home range might be. We can figure out the number of different individuals that we have in a particular area. And ultimately, we can figure out the density of animals. And so here's an example of one of the things we can do. The orange cameras that are, that are highlighted here are cameras that photograph this one individual, Macho C was his name. And that means that this is roughly the area that this animal moves in or lives in. And we can do that with another cat. This is a female, Ember B. And the orange cameras are showing where we documented that individual. Okay, so once we have this ability to recognize all these individuals, we can start to ask more detailed questions about how did these ocelots react to the disturbance of oil exploration. And so this is some of the data that we got. This is the number of days that we had cameras running before the exploration occurred, which is the control period, and then during the disturbance. Um, and the number of photo events of ocelots that we recorded. And you can see that during the disturbance period was a bit longer. Capture frequency is the number of photos per 100 nights um, or per 100 camera nights. So a camera night is a night that has one camera active. And so each night that goes by, we had 23 camera nights. And in the end there, you can see that we had 22 individuals in the control period when there was no disturbance going on and 27 individuals in the disturbance period. And this doesn't mean, this is an important note here, this doesn't mean that there were more ocelots in the study area then. Because as you go on in time, running the cameras longer, you would expect to photograph more different individuals. And really, at no point are you ever going to photograph all of them. So we use statistical software called Capture to actually figure out how many cats are likely to be living there. And what that does is it basically looks at how often are these cats being re-photographed multiple times, and how often are you photographing new individuals? And that lets you calculate, finally, how many cats you have in total. And so once we use the data in the software here, we actually estimated exactly the same number of cats using our study area, regardless of the disturbance that was going on. So what does this mean? What do we conclude here? What this does not mean is that animals aren't affected by exploration operations. Um, a lot of these operations are done differently depending on the company that is doing them. Habitat can have a big influence, and here we're only looking at one species. What it does mean, though, is that this species in particular did not appear to be influenced significantly by these operations, and that's an important conclusion. Um, we know that the animals didn't move out of the area because the same number of cats were using the area and the same individuals, and they didn't change their activity patterns. And so this was an important conclusion. This is encouraging, of course. And we also did a uh, study at the same time looking at primates. And there's different methodologies that are used to look at primates. They don't come down to the ground very often, so the cameras aren't very useful. Uh, but we walk censuses and record numbers of primates seen. And we observed 211 groups total during our study period. And counter rate is just the number of groups that we saw per 10 kilometers walked. And we had nine different species in our study area. And so in the control period before disturbance was happening, um, we had almost 14 groups per 10 kilometers and almost 12 groups 
during the disturbance uh, that was going on. And so this was encouraging as well. There wasn't a significant reduction in the primates that were using the area while the disturbance was happening. But we did have some mixed results. There was one species, an endangered species of primate called a white-bellied spider monkey, that was found uh, much less frequently during the disturbance. And so uh, we're interested to continue research on that species in particular to see what might be going on there. And so I'm sort of going to close on my favorite photograph that we have. This is a ja male jaguar that we photographed in the study area. And, you know, I want to sort of, ho hopefully I got across in the talk here how much time and effort goes into and how challenging it can be to answer relatively simple research questions and conservation questions. We looked at one species, um, or at least I talked about today, one species, and we're going through the data now to to see what conclusions we can make about some of the other individuals. For example, Margay and Jaguar, we can identify those individuals. And we know that there wasn't a reduction in the number of Margay and Jaguar that were in the study area as well, just like the ocelot. So that was encouraging as well. But we're working through the data to see what else we can get out of this huge amount of photos. And so we've walked through an example here of, of looking at a conservation issue and reasoning through how we might make some conclusions about for example here, what's the impact of these operations? And some of the big issues here is how can we conserve wildlife if we don't know what's there? Camera trapping has been a great tool to document what species are in a location that can then inform our conservation decisions. And then how do we mitigate the effects of disturbance if we don't know what they are? So we need to do more studies like this to figure out how wildlife is responding to these different disturbances that are going on throughout the world. Um, and the other point I want to make is that studies like this one would be impossible without forming partnerships with uh, the oil and gas companies that are doing these activities. There would be absolutely no way we could get into this rainforest without the support of the company. Um, and to be able to work with them in the same area while they're working would be impossible without this kind of partnership. So obviously, as the Smithsonian, we need to be really careful about the companies that we make commitments to work with. Uh, but we also need to recognize that in order to get this important information, these partnerships are really crucial. So um, I want to close with a sort of plug for camera trapping. I encourage everybody to get a camera trap. The ones that we use in our study cost about $500 a piece, but you can get a very good camera trap for less than $100. And so I encourage you to put them up in your yard, even if you live in the city, you can photograph bird life, you can photograph all kinds of things with these cameras. And this is a slide that shows photographs that I took last month, one hour's drive outside of Washington, D.C., in a town called Front Royal, Virginia. So we've got here uh, all kinds of predators. We got bobcat, gray fox, a black bear, coyote, and wild turkey. And so this is just an hour outside of a huge metropolitan area. So you don't need to be a biologist to get out and figure out what wildlife you have living around you. And lastly, I'll just close with a picture of our full research team here, because obviously it wasn't just me out there. It was a huge effort to collect this, this data. Um, and uh, this shows some of my Peruvian assistants and the rest of the biologists that were a huge part of this research effort. Joe, this is a, a pretty amazing journey that you've taken us through. And it's amazing when you think about the amount of work, as you said, that goes into this, the coordination, um, and yet the, the need to really focus on one particular species. You could go back endlessly and be studying specific behaviors of specific exactly. animals of specific yeah. species. So I, I love your invitation to all of us to get involved in this work. I'm reminded, by the way, of the exhibit hall area that has not only all of the great stuff that uh, Joe and his colleagues have posted uh, related to the work you learned about today, but there's also something you might find unusual, but that's related from the Smithsonian Photography Initiative, which talks about how photography solves everyday problems. And we hope you'll take a look at that. And if you do decide to use a camera trap or just your regular cell phone camera and take a picture of something in your yard or in your area, we do hope you'll share it back and show us how you solve the problem with photography. I'm going to get my mom a camera trap for Mother's Day so she can find out which raccoon is opening her trap. Oh, <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> Thank you to everyone for taking part today. Uh, we'll continue to take your questions here uh, and take note of them, but we do encourage you to visit the discussion area where you can continue to post questions and comments for Joe. Uh, that's located right under the login button that you use to get into today's session.
Remember that our session recordings are all available indefinitely, so check them out. And please join me in thanking Smithsonian Education for bringing us together with the support of the Office of the Chief Information Officer and our sponsor, Microsoft in Learning. I'm Jonathan from Learning Times, and I'll be back with you in 59 minutes for our last session today and our last session of the conference. We're going to be looking at biodiversity. A lot of you were asking about what about things that are underneath the camera level uh, or above the camera level. We're going to go into the canopy, and we're going to look at at beetles and find out about how you can track these in the rainforest and you won't want to miss that either. Joe, thanks so much. No, it was my pleasure. Also, uh, we'll show you a picture of the uh, session from uh, the illustrations that have come up. And before you go, we hope you'll take a moment and give us some feedback about today's uh, recent session that we just did just now with Joe Kalowski. So click that link at the top left corner. We'll be back before the top of the hour to share Dan Porter's illustrations with you. Thanks again, everyone.